Welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. But spring, kind of, it was 24 degrees here last night in Central Oregon, so I'm not quite convinced yet, either are my horses, but the grass is starting to green up a little bit, which means laminitis season has officially started. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking it's practically summer, like we're pushing 90 degrees. <laughs> you, you, live, you live in an alternate universe. <laughs> I really do. But anyway, it is a great time to talk about insulin dysregulation in horses, which kind of goes hand in hand with laminitis. And this is obviously, it's very painful and frequently a deadly condition. I've been unfortunate enough to manage a horse personally with laminitis, and it's really extremely emotionally difficult. And laminitis is caused by inflammation and breakdown of the tissue that supports the coffin bone within the hoof capsule. So there's a bone inside of the horse's hoof, and it is sort of held to the hoof wall by these lamina. When they break down, we get laminitis. Yeah. And then ultimately that can result in what a lot of horse owners commonly know as founder, which is where the, the coffin bone has rotated within that hoof capsule, which is profoundly painful. And overall, laminitis is just really awful if you've had to deal with it, which most of us have with our time with horses. There are several causes for laminitis, but today we're going to be specifically talking about insulin-related laminitis, and we're joined by a guest. We have a guest again, I'm Dr. Laura Javikas, who is an internal medicine specialist with Rhinebeck Equine Hospital in New York. Thank you for joining us to talk about this horrible... I'm excited about you being here. I'm not excited about the topic. Thanks so much for having me. I am also excited to talk with you all today, but not about laminitis. <laughs> yeah. So in the thick of it right now, Laura? Yes. The ang- yes. I'm in, in the Hudson Valley in New York and the grass has gotten nice and green in the last two weeks, but we've seen multiple cases. Yeah. I'm sure it's difficult for you guys too as veterinarians. It can't be fun for you either. No, not at all. It's an awful, awful disease to manage. There is a lot of things we can do to help manage these horses that struggle with laminitis. That's, I think, kind of the, the good news is, is that education is really valuable around this. So I'm really excited to have this discussion today for that reason, because I really hope that our discussion will be able to help horses and owners make informed decisions to hopefully prevent having to deal with laminitis, which would be a win-win for everybody. So I think in our introduction, I mentioned the term insulin dysregulation. I know I've used insulin resistance. Those are two terms we see used often interchangeably. Laura, could you explain the difference between insulin resistance and insulin dysregulation? And are they both correct to use or is one correct in sometimes and the other in others? Like how should we be using them correctly? Sure, I'll do my best to explain it. I think insulin dysregulation is a bit more of an umbrella term than it, to me insulin resistance is really talking about what is happening at the tissue level within the horse's tissues. And so insulin resistance means that insulin is no longer having a normal effect on the tissues. So that in horses, there's a normal amount of insulin released from the pancreas, but it does not have the same effect on cells that it should. And so glucose enters cells at a lower rate, leading to higher levels of glucose in the horse's system. Insulin dysregulation refers to the a horse that has, if a horse has insulin dysregulation, then they can have a combination of a high 
baseline insulin level in their blood or a spike after eating or after some of the tests that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Or they can have insulin resistance tissue at the tissue level. So insulin dysregulation is sort of encompasses insulin resistance, which is happening at the tissue level throughout the horse's body. Yeah, I think we as humans often think of insulin in terms of diabetes in humans. Is this similar to diabetes in humans? Are our horses, quote, diabetic? Because that's not a term that I've ever hear associated with the horses. Yeah, what horses have is much more analogous. So equine metabolic syndrome is much more analogous to type 2 diabetes than completely different from type 1 diabetes in people, which is a disorder of the pancreas. That is exceedingly rare in horses, really not something we we worry about. This is this dysregulation of insulin and the way the cells throughout the body interact with insulin is similar to type 2 diabetes in people because it's really what happens at the tissue level throughout the body that is the problem, not a disorder of the pancreas. Yeah, so it's my understanding that type 1 diabetic humans don't produce enough insulin, whereas, you know, type 2 diabetic humans produce the insulin. It just doesn't work the way it should, and that's much more similar to horses. We don't see a lot of horses, is my understanding, that don't produce enough insulin. They're producing enough insulin. The insulin just isn't working the way it's supposed to, either because Correct. the tissues aren't sensitive enough to it or, you know, other things as well. But yeah, exactly. And then when they have that insulin resistance at the tissue level, it leads to high glucose levels in the blood. And then that signals the pancreas to secrete even more insulin. So you get into this loop really stemming from the insulin resistance at the tissue level. So, Dr. LJ, you mentioned equine metabolic syndrome and that this umbrella term. Can you have insulin dysregulation and insulin resistance without equine metabolic syndrome? Or can you have equine metabolic syndrome without ID and IR? Or are they always connected to each other? You can have insulin dysregulation without metabolic syndrome. But on the day-to-day, it doesn't really tend to occur. And so that's the scenario I would think of would be if we are inducing insulin dysregulation by other medications that we're giving, most often that would be with corticosteroids, which we know induces insulin dysregulation. But from a practical standpoint, what we're really worried about with our patients is horses with equine metabolic syndrome that have these sustained high levels of insulin which can wreak havoc, particularly on the lamella in the feet. Years ago, I sat in a presentation at an equine science symposium and someone was doing, they were, they were inducing insulin resistance in a horse for an experimental setting and we're using dexa, dexamethasone to do that. And that really got, it's funny, I don't actually remember very much about the rest of the talk because I remember sitting there thinking, oh my golly, like people use dex a little bit off-label quite frequently. Like, I wonder if they realize that they're actually potentially making their horses insulin resistant when they right. do that. That was a little shocking to me, actually. Well, and that's something I that. that I think we become a lot more cognizant of as equine veterinarians. And now it is much more routine that we test insulin levels and try to determine if the horse has metabolic syndrome or has insulin dysregulation prior to starting to treat them with steroids because there are many conditions that require long-term use of steroids. And, you know, fortunately, we are starting to have more and more options for those, but sometimes it's really the only choice. And so when we're talking about our older population in particular, what I see all the time is horses that have equine asthma uh, and then also it's the same demographic that has PPID and often EMS in conjunction with that. So, Fortunately, I think that we have become a lot more aware of that because we do want to make sure that we're doing what we can to prevent those horses from going into a laminitic crisis if they're free to play. We're getting ourselves. We are. But it's it's interesting because when my my daughter has a pony a couple of years back, he has hawks injected. And now my lameness specialist does stall side testing on everything before doing any kind of weight injection. So that's been a big change. Oh, yes. two years ago, he wasn't doing that. Now he would do that with that horse. No, it's, yeah. To your point. Yeah. And I think so, just for the audience who maybe haven't handled decks for either equine asthma or maybe hives would be another reason. Maybe a horse 
I've had decks prescribed for my horse or or steroids that are used for joint injections. So those those are yeah, different exactly. contexts that we use those steroids. And they used to be used a little bit more freely. And now we're all kind of pumping the brakes and being a little bit more cautious because of these metabolic issues. Did I get that all right? Yeah, that's exactly it. And yeah, definitely those the joint injections with particular which are long acting steroids in general mm-hmm. is definitely that's a big concern. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think I heard, you know, for several weeks after in at risk individuals, your laminitis risk goes up for a period of time after those joint injections. You have to be a little careful potentially about what else you do on the back end of that joint injection uh, yeah. in at-risk individuals. So I think it's really important if you, for those people, I know I'm this way, I have a lameness specialist vet and then my day-to-day vet. And if I go to my lameness specialist vet for, you know, maybe some workup and we end up, say, injecting hawks, and then a couple of weeks later something happens and the, my field vet comes out and we have to give steroid for that, I think it's important to tell your field vet, especially for an at-risk individual, we just did hawk injections a couple of weeks ago. We have steroids on board still, potentially. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Dr. LJ, so you mentioned PPID. We did a (laughs) drive-by. Yeah. (laughs) Of equine cushions. So that's another one that just adding to the layer of the endocrine problem horse cake. (laughs) Right. So how does PPID, are all PPID horses, do they all have equine metabolic syndrome or insulin issues? as well? Or is it just something that you need to be aware of if you have a PPID horse? Yeah. So it's the nice Venn diagram where you can have equine metabolic syndrome with or without PPID and you can have PPID with or without equine metabolic syndrome. However, if a horse has PPID, they are more likely to have equine metabolic syndrome or evidence of insulin dysregulation. And then what's really important to think about is about 30% of horses with PPID do have an episode of hyperinsulinemic associated laminitis, which is another another acronym. Ow. (laughs) (laughs) And we do actually have an episode. I think you were our guest on that episode too, where we had a great conversation about PPID. So for listeners yes. who have you know specific curiosities about that condition, I'd encourage them to go back and listen to that episode. Yeah, and then also, sure. I don't think we actually defined equine metabolic syndrome yet. That's syndrome. really important. Oh well, okay. I have, so so equine metabolic syndrome refers it's a syndrome. So it's a horse that has a collection of risk factors makes it associated highly associated with an increased risk for laminitis. But it's a combination of predisposing genetic factors and then environmental factors that can create equine metabolic syndrome in any given individual. So we know that there are predisposed breeds, but they do have to have those environmental factors as well. And so where they fall on that spectrum of how much is genetic and how much is environmental can vary. But the bottom line is we see similar constellation of clinical signs uh, being irregular fat deposits, insulin dysregulation, laminitis being the most common. And traditionally, they are the very easy keeping breeds that need only air, it seems, to maintain a body condition score of (laughs) nine out of nine. Um, But we do see some outliers as well. We do, there's a subset of horses that are actually quite thin, but still have metabolic syndrome and profound insulin dysregulation. And those tend to be the ones that are a bit more challenging to manage. Yeah, I've worked with a couple of those and those have been very, really heartbreaking for the owners because they didn't see any risk factors ahead of time. And, you know, they suddenly became laminitic out of nowhere in inverted commas. Yeah. And then out of due diligence, their vet team ran all the diagnostics. And sure enough, but you didn't look at this horse and it didn't look what we call phenotypically like a metabolic horse. And I guess that's worth touching on, like, what does a phenotypic, what does a metabolic horse look like? The stereotypic metabolic horse, because you touched on a little bit like genetics and things and certain breeds, but you know, for people listening who are curious, you know, I know I walk into bonds and I kind of go, mm, uh-oh, kind of thing. But, but yeah, so the more classic ones we think about are Morgans, Pasifinos, quarter horses, ponies, you know, minis, donkeys. But we can see it. It's pretty common in warm bloods as well. If we do see it in a variety of breeds, I would say thoroughbreds are lower on the list. They tend to be on the opposite end of the spectrum. But it is possible. And unfortunately, as you're saying, I sometimes see those horses that have had 
have had a steroid during injection and then have a laminitic flare seemingly out of the blue. And that's the first thing that triggers people to test their insulin levels. And that's a very frustrating situation because not all of them are have the phenotype to make you suspicious right ahead of time. Yeah. For me, when I walk in a barn, all those breeds you mentioned, and for me, it's the regional fat deposits, assuming they're overweight, yeah. right? It's the regional fat deposits. The crusty neck for me is always kind of a, you know, kind of yeah. warning sign. I'm always like, if the, if the crest feels like memory foam, you know, it shouldn't feel like memory foam. You know, if you can put your thumb in it and you take your thumb out and then it, it acts like memory foam, that's fat. That's not, you know, it's not muscle. And yeah, um, and it's interesting too, the, we've been talking so much about laminitis, but I've also had those clients who sort of say, oh, well, you know, he gets abscesses every May or every September or whatever. And again, that just is part of this, not realizing that perhaps that is subclinical laminitis, that they're not realizing, they're seeing it as an abscess in isolation and they're not thinking about the big right. picture of what that might be. There are sometimes these little warning signs when you go back through a horse's history that you know, might make me say to a client that I'm working with, I think you need to talk to your vet. You know, I'm seeing things that suggest to me there's some metabolic dysregulation going on here. You know, I think you need to talk to your vet. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing I advise owners to do is to really pay attention to their horse's body type and fat distribution because anything that is a significant change from their normal baseline, if they start to all of a sudden see some fat deposits or just if they talk about redistribution of fat, you know, maybe their neck is a little bit crustier or all of a sudden that can be an early sign, but it can be very hard. And so the other thing, which I think is important to remember, especially as it relates to PPID, is that we can see EMS in very young horses. It is not exclusively a middle age to older horse disease like PPID is. So we can often will start testing as low levels early on in a horse's life if they are of that predisposition or we have any reason to suspect. So it's a great thing to think about this time of year when people are doing spring shots. If you're having any baseline blood work done, which I'm a huge advocate of for a number of reasons, but uh, it's easy enough to add an insulin level to that. No. So with the connection between these metabolic issues and laminitis, you know, laminitis is in the feet, and we're talking about feeding the horses. Why is it laminitis? What leads to laminitis in these horses? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and there's still a bit unknown about the exact pathophysiology of that, but what we do know is that when they're in sustained hyperinsulinemia, meaning the insulin levels in the blood remain high um, for a prolonged period of time then the lamella, which is what connects the cop and bone to the hoof wall, start to stretch and become damaged. And then ultimately that can result in rotation of that bone or sinking of the bone. And so it's that initial stretching and damaging that happens due to high insulin levels. It's thought that it's probably mediated through a certain protein, insulin-like growth factor in the lamella. And that's why the lamella is a very vulnerable spot. It's a very different pathophysiology from other kinds of laminitis that we see specifically from sepsis. There's no, in hyperinsulinemic associated laminitis, there's no disruption of what's called the basement membrane where those lamella attach, which is different from sepsis-induced laminitis. So we know that a little bit from experimental studies and some studies of naturally occurring laminitis cases in horses with endocrine disorders that, you know, because there's a question of how long those levels have to be sustained. Um, in ponies that had a high NSC diet, if their insulin levels were above 200 for more than five days, which is not that long, <laughs> yeah, um, they could be predisposed to laminitis. And then experimentally can actually induce laminitis by infusing insulin. And in that study, the insulin levels were over, it only took 48 to 72 hours with insulin levels above 500, which is quite high. But that was a pretty telling study that you could take a normal horse and give them high levels of insulin and induce laminitis. We don't have that information, right? You said, you know, the 200, and then there's always that yeah. question of, so what happens if your value is 150 for 30 days, right? And we just, we don't write right. that yet. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you have these critical but, cutoffs that we know if you do this for this many days, you're very likely going to get laminitis. What we don't know is if your horse is out on pasture 
three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, eating great quality pasture, and it's at risk of laminitis, how high does that have to be? It may not have to be that high if the length of time is way longer kind of thing. So, right. Yeah. And I think it's also really important to understand that that initial damage is often, you can't appreciate it clinically. So there's damage happening but it's subclinical. And so once the horse gets to the point that they're actually showing signs of lameness, there can already be extensive damage there. So it's you can have these silent cases that don't make themselves apparent. And But that's it's a great point. We don't know exactly what levels for how long. And naturally occurring, we just know the labella does not like insulin. <laughs> the bottom and I've always, you know, like I mentioned earlier about abscesses, but I've always, it's always made me curious. My mom had a horse that just had really bad ongoing CD toe, right? Or horses that have kind of ongoing white line disease and things. These are all breakdowns in the area between the hoof wall and the internal structures of the feet. So it always just makes me wonder, like you said, they're not clinically presenting as laminitis and obvious pain or whatever, but there's clearly something going on in that foot. And maybe we should be one yeah. a little further than just the feet, that maybe that chronic white line or that chronic CD toe might be an indicator of some rumbling breakdown that's there that we're not realizing. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll often take radiographs in horses that are suspicious phenotype and but have not actually had any episodes of lameness. And we can see chronic changes on the coffin bone radiographically that interesting. and the owner has never been aware that the horse has even had laminitis. So I think baseline radiographs are another really important thing to think about. And when we think about sort of screening these cases. Oh, that was, that, was, that was a study in the UK, wasn't there, that looked at that, something about owner, like owner recognition of laminitis and right. badly we're missing it. Many, Absolutely. Many times. Yeah. yeah. I had one I got regular radiographs on and, and he did have just a little bit of change towards the end of his years that surprised me. I wasn't expecting there to be a little a little bit of rotation of his coffin bones. I think that it would be worth us talking briefly about the clinical signs of laminitis because we've talked a little bit about what insulin dysregulation or equine metabolic syndrome might look like. But if there is an active case of laminitis, what might the owner observe? Yeah, so the classic signs of severe laminitis would be lameness typically in both front feet to the point that they are rocking back to get weight off of their front feet. But hopefully we are picking up on it before they get to that point. And so when I think it is most obvious is when the horse is turning. So if you're taking them out to the field and they're all of a sudden reluctant to turn in one direction or the other, just because that makes them weight their foot more unevenly, they can they will often stumble or act painful on that foot that they're turning towards. And so it's a good practice, I think, just to, as you're walking your horse, just to make sure they're comfortable to watch them walk. But you can also see a short stride. Again, this, the front feet tend to be affected first because they bear more body weight than the hind feet, but it can certainly affect all four feet. Um, we certainly can see it affecting all four feet at the same time. And sometimes those horses can be a little bit harder to tell that they're actually lame because the presenting call from the owner may be that they're laying down more frequently than normal. And sometimes people will think that they're colicking when in fact they're just trying to get weight off their feet. So usually if they're laying down and you get them up and then they may rock back at that point or act very reluctant to move. So we can see a whole spectrum of signs, but that really that pain when turning and just reluctance to move or wanting to lay down more than they usually do. The other thing you can do if you're suspicious that they maybe are a little uncomfortable is pick up one front foot and see if they then act unwilling or uncomfortable standing on the other foot. You know, normal, and it's a good reason to your horse's feet out every day because, you know, they as a normal horse should have no problem standing on one front foot for almost an indefinite amount of time. Whereas when they start to have laminatic pain, they'll try to put that foot down really quickly and be reluctant to stand on one foot. Do you tend to find heat in the feet at all? You can, but we certainly see cases that do not have appreciable heat in their feet, depending on how chronic the process has been. The other thing is digital pulses. So it's a good thing to learn, have your veterinarian show you how to feel your horse's digital pulses. They should always have a pulse there. Their arteries, you want, you want it to have a pulse. It's how 
astounding how easy it is to feel that pulse that can be telling. So it's a good thing to know what is normal for your horse. But those pulses can also be increased with things like a hoof abscess. So it doesn't always mean laminitis, but it's a good thing to be aware of. And so what I try to appreciate is how strong the pulse is and then how far up their cannon bone I can feel it. So horses with extreme laminitic pain will often have a bounding pulse well up their cannon bone as opposed to just down around their cestoids at a normal horse. And to me, anything that might indicate laminitis would be an emergency. Is that your advice is to treat it yes. as an emergency? Yes, I agree. You know, I think particularly if the horse has not previously been diagnosed with laminitis and it's painful, then it definitely warrants further investigation immediately and support for the hoof directly. So there are some things we can do in, in an emergency situation. You've got special padding, soft rides, things like that to put on the foot to provide immediate mechanical support and provide more comfort to the horse. Yeah. And that's where laminitis becomes this thing where it's this balance between the nutrition and your vet who's taking care of the horse. And then also you get into the podiatry piece of managing it that's with really. your yeah, so with your vet who maybe you have access to someone who specializes in podiatry and then your farrier is also part of that care team or your hoof care professional, your trimmer. So all things to keep in mind. And this is why laminitis turns into such a huge topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to swing it back to uh, the insulin dysregulation part. Once you have an indication that a horse might have insulin dysregulation, what is the testing process to confirm that? Yeah, so that has gotten complicated as well. I've been so <laughs> because insulin and glucose levels in the blood are dynamic, depending on you know, the normal cycle for all of us is that when we eat food, it stimulates our pancreas to release insulin, which stimulates our cells to uh, take up glucose from our food. And so it's really important to think about what that horse has eaten before they are tested. And so there's a few different ways to test them. And I always think about, you know, what is my goal with this test? If we're trying to get an initial diagnosis of a case, then I am more likely to do what's called an oral sugar test, which is a stimulation test where we are giving them a measured amount of carrot syrup, a measured amount of glucose, and then taking a blood sample uh, to see what their insulin response is to that controlled amount of glucose that we're exposing them to. And um, once we have a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, sorry, let me back up and say, in some cases, we can also use just a baseline insulin blood sample, meaning we don't have to give them the oral sugar uh, and we're only taking one blood sample. But you want to think about what was that horse eating? Have they been fasted or a, have they been on, have they received any grain or grass in the last three to four hours that is going to influence that insulin? To me, I try to avoid that situation. And if I'm going to test them with a baseline sample, I would either, ideally, I like to have them just be eating their regular hay source, which should not cause a giant spike in the insulin but to see where their insulin is at at that time. Now, that is, of course, also going to depend on the sugar content of the hay, which is where it gets very complicated. So, and that's the oral sugar test is a more sensitive test and is more controlled. And so that's my preference for initial diagnosis. However, if I'm in a situation where the horse cannot have a short-term fast for some reason to do the oral sugar test, or I really want to get a sample because usually because they're having a laminated crisis and I want to have some idea of how high their insulin level is at that time, taking into account that it may also be influenced by pain uh, <laughs> slightly, then I will get a baseline sample. But I need to interpret those results knowing what the horse was eating when that sample was taken. So in my situation, I get a lot of blood work sent to me from referring veterinarians and our ambulatory veterinarians. And that's always my first question is, what was the horse eating when this was when this was taken? Because we have different acceptable ranges depending on what they've been eating. Once I've made the diagnosis of equine metabolic syndrome, then I actually prefer just to do a baseline insulin when they have not had grass or grain 
for a period of three to four hours. Uh, so because I really want to know, and that has been a change in the last few years, the general recommendation used to always be to get a fasted insulin sample. But now we've moved more to testing when they are on their regular hay diet. And if you think about it, that's really giving us a better idea of what's happening in their body on an average day because they're really not fasting for any period of time But in the case of most horses. So we really want to know what their insulin levels are when they're eating their normal diet. And that can also give us an idea of do we need to get even more stringent about what they are eating. So for example, if they're eating regular grass hay, do we know what the sugar content is of that hay? Do we need to have that t- hay tested? Do we a controlled chopped hay instead change the diet? So doing by getting those samples and not in a fasted state from a monitoring standpoint. So once you have sorted through all of that <laughs> and you've made the diagnosis, then how do you go about treating and managing these horses? I mean, yeah. is, it, is it treatable? Can you reverse it or is it a long-term management? So once we have a diagnosis, unless there was a precipitating cause where the horse may have had a period of insulin dysregulation, but not truly EMS, 9.9 times out of 10 is a situation where we are managing it for the rest of the horse's life because they likely have that genetic predisposition and so that we're trying to manage the environmental factors as best we can. And so diet is absolutely a huge part of that, probably the most important part. And I'll let Claire talk a little about that. But then there's also, or I can, but uh, so controlling the amount of starch in the diet is very important. You know, typically we are limiting or eliminating exposure to grass because of the sugar content in the grass. But apart from diet, there are some medications that can be helpful to help either short-term or long-term with controlling those insulin levels. But really, I'm always trying trying to use medication in the short term to get those insulin levels under control while we adjust the diet because long term we really need to make sure the diet is well controlled and not rely on medications, which can be very challenging for horse owners to do. We all want to just have an easy pill to fix things. In terms of medications, things like levothyroxine, Thyro-L is a name brand, can be very helpful in the short term. It increases the metabolic rate and does help with treat the insulin dysregulation. I just want to point out we are not treating these horses for hypothyroidism, which is really not a clinical problem in horses. Uh, It's very confusing to horse owners. Yes. Um, We are using it to help with the insulin dysregulation and thyroid really should only be used in the short term, ideally three to six months to help get them out of better weight and get that insulin under control while we get them on a good diet. And then there are also some other supplements that can be useful in some horses, supplements containing resveratrol in particular, which is a, an antioxidant. And then we now have a, a new group of medications that we're using more and more, which are the glucose transport inhibitors. So things like Steglatro, please don't ask me to pronounce the name of the medication. <laughs> uh, and Steglatro is the name brand and Invocata is another that are in that group of medications And they are really, truly life-changing in managing the really, really tough cases. But they should be reserved to cases that are not responding to aggressive diet change and management elsewhere. And there definitely are those those horses. But we want to use that not as a crutch. (laughs) It should be a second line. However, they are also, they actually can help horses that are having a laminated crisis as well. So I now use them kind of in in two different groups of horses, sort of for medium to long-term management, but then also in those horses that are having just been diagnosed or having a laminated crisis, I will start them on that to try to get those insulin levels down quickly because we know that that insulin, high insulin is damaging the lamella. So trying to stop that cascade as quickly as we can. So I feel like we horse owners, there's a lot of these metabolic horses. Yes. A lot of people are managing them. 
And I feel like we have been well-educated in NSCs in feeds. And so I heard NSCs mentioned in the conversation a little earlier. So I'm going to turn that over to Claire to explain what the NSCs are succinctly, because we are running towards the end of our time today, but it's important And also, it seems like horse owners, we can get really fixated and only thinking about NSCs and maybe lose sight of the big picture. But Claire, maybe I'm wrong on that. I'm not sure, but that's kind of my my feeling. No, it's true. I mean, I think the biggest thing I see on that is people get very fixated on the NSCs of the bagged feed that they're feeding. And then to Dr. Laura's point, not always considering like the forages that they're feeding because they often don't have a lot of control over those. They're provided by that boarding situation or they go to the feed store and buy a bale here and there. And so there's no continuity in the hay that they're feeding. And that could, you know, as she mentioned, be fluctuating all over the place. So, you know, ideally we recommend trying to keep the non-structural carbohydrate, that's what NSC stands for, that's your starch and your sugar, below 10% in the diet on what we call as-fed basis. And it can be a challenge to find hays that A, are tested. A lot of people are not buying tested hay. And B, then you have a tested hay and then it's not below 10% on an as-fed basis. So that's where the soaking comes in because soaking hay will help dissolve out some of that water-soluble sugar. It does not remove starch. Starch is not water-soluble but it will help get rid of some of the sugar. And so it'll make the hay that you're feeding safer. Whether it makes the hay safe, that depends on what you started with, right? And the research shows that different hays leach out different amounts of sugar over different periods of time. So it's still a bit of a situation. You don't really know what you're dealing with unless you test it after it's soaked. But at least we know it's lower after you've soaked it for like 60 minutes in cold water. And you don't need to soak it for longer than that because then you start leaching out other nutrients that we actually need to have in the diet. And then obviously we need to put in, as we always do, our missing minerals and vitamins and things. That's really important in these horses. You know, for example, like zinc's really important for hoof health and vitamin E's and antioxidant. And especially if you have a horse in crisis, they're going to need all these things to help rebuild healthy feet and to deal with that kind of assault. So we can end up in a situation where these horses are being sort of, end up being with very deficient diets because we're decreasing the amount of NSC so much and we're feeding sort of low nutritional value forages that they're actually, if you don't add those missing pieces of vitamin minerals back in, you can end up with deficient diets, which isn't going to help your horse be as healthy and able to handle all these issues as well as they could. So that's something to, so that's where the ration balances become really helpful. And then we have some, you know, we touched on like resveratrol, but there's also some other interesting things now. Like we now have an FDA approved chromium, which is making its way into some feeds. And there's some research showing that that actually can help horses improve their glucose uptake. So that's going to be helpful for those horses that are not very insulin sensitive, right? When their cells don't respond well to insulin, so their glucose levels stay high too long. And therefore the body says, "Uh uh-oh, glucose isn't dropping quick enough, pump out more insulin, right? So their insulin levels go up. What this chromium is doing is actually helping the cells respond better to the insulin that's there. So the glucose gets taken out of the bloodstream and into the cells. And so the body goes, oh, good. You know, glucose is back to normal. Don't need any more insulin. So that's really helpful. And so I'm starting to see that being used more in some products. And I'm certainly, you know, using that where I can with some of these horses. And I think the big thing we haven't really talked about, which is important, is exercise. And we focused a lot on laminitis. And we've because we've been talking about the critical horses, but at the end of the day, like the ideal is you don't get there, right? Is that we do all these management techniques and we don't get to a laminitis case. And so it's much easier to help manage these horses and keep their weight where it needs to be while they're still sound and able to move than wait too long. And unfortunately, they get laminitis and now they're unable to walk. So you can't move them to get the weight off them. That then becomes a huge challenge, right? So really being good about weight management, condition scoring your horse at least once a month, putting a weight tape on them once a month. Because as we talked about earlier, it's hard when you see them every day. Fat just kind of sneaks on, right? Especially if it's going on sort of all over the body. We sometimes don't realize that they're actually gaining quite a lot of weight. Or even if we're riding them, the girth goes up the same, but we're not realizing their back fat is going up, their crest fat is going up. So really taking the time to be objective about condition scoring, weighing them and stuff is really important. And then there's all the tools out there to help them. You know, if you're having to restrict calorie intake to maintain weight, using those slow hold hay nets, using the 
trickle feeder options that are out there are really useful for these horses. And if you're feeding hay out in a dirt lot situation with these horses, can you spread your hay out and make them move, right? You know, don't just like dump all the hay right by the water trough by the gate. So all they do is just stand right in the gateway all day long eating, you know, spread it out, hang one in that corner and hang another hay net over there. Make them walk, you know, make them move as much as you can. There's, there's a lot of tools out there and your veterinarian can help you with a management plan. I help people with that too, because it is that, that it's a multifaceted, like you have to approach it from all angles. Yeah, definitely a team approach. And on, on the movement piece, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, well, maybe Dr. LJ, you can touch on this. Like you mentioned like the subclinical cases, how would you know if they shouldn't be exercising if they aren't obviously lame? Do you it's have good, any guidance? That's a good question. I mean, I think if they're moving comfortably, then I try to keep them moving. And you know, like Claire said, exercise is so important. And I think just another thing I recommend to a lot of people is if they have access to a field with a hill in it, I recommend turning the horses out there so they have to walking up and down the hill and to get their food that you spread out all around instead of a small flat pasture, if that's possible. And if there can be on that pasture due to the grass content. And then the other thing, just to reiterate what Sarah was saying about having those ways to monitor, I'm a huge fan of taking pictures of horses. So whenever I go to assess them, I'm always taking a picture from the thigh, looking at their neck specifically, and then from the back too, to assess the fat around their rump. And so that's certainly something owners can do just to keep their own record of what their horse looks like, because it is so hard to remember when you see them frequently. Yeah. And I think it's really important. I mean, I feel like we've been a bit doom and gloom today. <laughs> but, you know, but I think really, when it goes bad, it goes so bad. <laughs> I know. And it is, like, we've all been yeah. there. So got it. But I want to say, like, I work with a lot of horses that have metabolic issues and are extremely successful competition horses and are out there living amazing lives, being amazing athletes. And they're very well managed. And actually, the better you manage them, the more leeway you have to in what and how you manage them. And just being diligent, doing the frequent blood work, testing them to stay on top of it, figuring out what different diets do for them. And can I feed this? No, nope, that makes the, you know, insulin go too high. Let's change the diet. I mean, it's, you know, when people come and work with me, it's not uncommon that we're, we try something and then we do the blood work. I know it's getting better, but now let's add this and see if it gets better still. And it, it is a work in progress, but they can be very successful athletes. So I don't want anyone to think that if their horse gets diagnosed or if they go out tonight and, the, you know, they go look at their horse and go, oh my gosh, everything they said, that looks like my horse, you know. <laughs> It's okay. You know, we can manage these horses and they can be very successful. And as I said earlier, with the education, you don't, hopefully you won't end up with the laminitis. Yeah. I have one final question for Dr. LJ before we wrap. And that's how often would you, as the vet who's taking care of these horses, like to see the owners bring them in for blood work? That's a good question. I think it's hard to have a blanket policy for that because it really depends how where they're at in the process. You know, have they had signs of laminitis? Did we just diagnose them? Did we start a new medication? So I think that if everything is stable, then I think many horses are okay being seen, you know, having blood work tested once a year, even just as a baseline of things are stable. But owners should be prepared that when we do start making changes with the diet, that it can be really helpful to recheck at that point or with medications. And also, it's, you know, we can gain a lot of information, again, just by you know, they're sending pictures of what they look like, what their body condition looks like. So we can get a lot from that as well. Okay. And just to throw it out there, it's if you take your horse in to get this blood work done, you have to hang out a little bit, right? Yeah, it's a good point. And so I didn't go into the timing a lot with the oral sugar test, but it is a bit, It ideally, we are getting a baseline sample, which I do like to have when it's the first time I'm trying to get a diagnosis for a particular horse that if I'm suspicious that they have metabolic syndrome. So we get a baseline sample and then our second sample is 60 to 90 minutes after that, which is challenging to do on farm sometimes unless you're there for a period of time looking at other horses as well. There is a very acceptable workaround in many situations, which is to have, is to skip the baseline sample and to have the owner give the caro syrup and then have the veterinarian show up in that 60 to 90 minute period afterwards. So we do that quite a bit. And that is that is very acceptable in certain cases that I'm seeing on a referral basis. I do like to generally have more time points in there. But so we can we do have a workaround. 
it also does get a little tricky if we're trying to test for PPID at the same time as well. But <laughs> these are all things for your veterinarian to work out <laughs> the logistics of. But. Yeah, and tolerating yeah. stress and all that good stuff. But yeah, yeah. Whole. <laughs> yeah. I have been there with that horse. So, <laughs> well, that is all the time that we have today. Hopefully, we've shed some light on insulin dysregulation, equine metabolic syndrome, and insulin resistance. We touched on PPID a little bit, but we do have a full episode on that if you're looking for more info. Thank you, Dr. LJ, for joining us and bringing information from the vet's perspective. It's really helpful with these medical conditions. So, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. If you have questions about feeding your horses, you can contact us at info at scoopandscale.com. That's scoop and scale spelled out. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. And please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And we always love it when you share our episodes on your social media and with your friends. It's the greatest compliment. For the Scoop and Scale podcast and our one-year anniversary podcast at that, Claire. Can you believe we've been doing this for a year? Wow. (laughs) That's crazy. I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. 